If you recall, we are, we've now reached um, the part of the path which deals with meditation, and we are gearing up to practice mindfulness and concentration more deeply. So a lot of preliminary exercises and um, a rather simple one is not so much mindfulness as watchfulness. This is learning again to pay attention the heart of meditation and lack of attention is in fact the heart of many of our problems as well. So but lack of attention is at the heart of many of our human issues and attention and the power of attention is at the heart of our escape from those problems or at least subduing them, ameliorating them, softening them, learning some wisdom and some compassion for ourselves and others. How do we develop the power of attention? How do we develop it gradually, living as we do in a hectic, exploitative, manipulative and rather shallow world? It's not so easy for us living as we do now. Well, we've already had one or two exercises. Another rather nice preliminary exercise, which I call watchfulness or watchful walking, is just generally learning to pay more attention to what is around you. So strictly speaking, it's not mindfulness in the Buddha Dharma sense because it's outward rather than inward. Watchfulness is outward, mindfulness is inward. Let's start with what is easier, which is uh, the outward paying of attention. Even that we're not very good at, actually. If you remember my analogy of the, the torch with a narrow beam that just sees what is within the beam and excludes everything else in a previous talk. We need to broaden that beam and use it more intense, intensely and in a more investigating way, if you like. As a preliminary to doing that, let's just develop our power of attention to everything around us. So as I'm speaking now, your minds will be pretty narrowly focused on my voice and on what I'm saying. But then what about all the things that are being excluded? There's a bird chirping over there somewhere. There it goes, hear it again. Cheep, 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 cheep. <laughs> there may be the sound of rain. There may be the sound of wind. There may be what the ceiling looks like. There may be all sorts of things. Some pleasant and some perhaps not so pleasant. It's a good preliminary to develop one's power to be sensitive and more expansive or spacious in one's ability to attend. So here is a little exercise which you can try out and you would have done this probably anyway and that is when you go for a walk to switch on your senses one at a time. So for example uh, when we are walking we could switch on our our vision, our eyesight our ability to see and make it more sensitive. When we finish with that, we can then switch on our hearing and spend five minutes listening to what is around us as we go for our walk. And then we could touch stuff. We could switch on our sense of touch and spend five minutes touching various things around us. And then we could switch on even our, uh, our sense of taste and our sense of smell. How would this all work? Well, let's say you go for a walk. Uh, we're assuming it's somewhere fairly pleasant, but it could be somewhere unpleasant for that matter, because we don't want to be too discriminating here. We're not just uh, have a sort of romantic approach where we just selectively choose the things that we like. But let's think about what we see. If we're going for a walk somewhere, and we decide now, I'm really going to pay attention with what I see around me. So instead of walking and thinking about what's going on at work or paying the mortgage or worrying about something, let's actually look around, let's look upwards, let's see the sky, let's see the clouds, let's see the motion of the clouds. Let's look at the, the trees around us and the leaves and the way they rustle. Let's look at the light coming through the trees, as you can see the light coming through the trees outside. Just dwell on it for a while. Let's look at the grass, let's look at the footpath, let's look at things that perhaps are not so nice, things that people have left on the footpath. 
which might also give us cause for thought or cause for concern about the lack of attention that many of us have. So what we're doing is expanding the range or domain of our attention. This is quite important as a preliminary to developing mindfulness in which we learn to pay attention to inner, the inner arising of states of mind uh, and so on. So next time you go for a walk, let go of that worry for a moment and actually look at what is around you. If you're driving, now if you're driving, I do suggest that you do look where you're going <laughs> and notice the brake lights coming on in front of you. But at the same time, you could glance up at the sky, you could glance at the trees whizzing by, you might notice things that you would not otherwise have noticed. It's a way of enriching your life, actually, isn't it? Now, once we've done that, say we've done that five, ten minutes, then we say, okay, well, now I'm going to make an effort to switch on another sense, or what is often called a sense base in the ancient teachings. So, let's say hearing. I'm now going to switch on not just switch them on, because they're already switched on, I'm going to expand the range of my hearing. There's a crow that's crowing, qua 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 over there. Of course, he heard me saying that, so he stopped now. <laughs> He's probably hearing us. He's probably hearing my voice but not paying that much attention to it, unless I become a threat. So when you're going for your walk, listen. That's the se second stage. Listen to anything and everything. Now, you know, the mind will be judgmental. When the jet plane comes over, we probably think, oh, what an awful noise. On the other hand, we may think of going on holiday and start fantasizing about that. But there will be birds, there will be the rustling of leaves. How many of us have taken out even 10 seconds of our time to listen to le leaves rustling in the wind? Isn't that a marvelous thing? Aren't these things that the poets write about? There may be water, there may be creatures scurrying about. Have you ever tried to just sit completely still somewhere uh, where it's green and stay you see, by, by arriving at that place and sitting down, you will have disturbed a lot of creatures. They know that you're there. The earthworms know, know, quotation marks, that you're there. Because you've sent vibrations to the ground. There will be mice underground. There will be all sorts of things like centipedes and insects and ants. And <coughs> there will be birds. There will be other creatures. Maybe there's a fox's lair that you don't know about that's just... 10 yards away, but you've n never noticed it. All those creatures have certainly noticed your approach. Now, when you settle down for 10 minutes, they start to forget about you, or they think that you've gone, or that you've fallen asleep, and then they start to wake up. Give them 15, 20 minutes, and you're perfectly still. They have become completely oblivious to your presence, and something will pop up somewhere. Once I did this many years ago, and a mole actually popped up right in front of me. First I noticed the soil moving and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> so this is what enlightenment is like. The earth starts moving. <laughs> and I just, I just looked and looked and I didn't make a sound. And then this little nose came up, sniffing about. A little blind mole with black furry face popped up right in front of me. And he, I, I don't know whether, he, whether he probably smelt me or something, but he only came halfway up and then he went back down his hole looking for worms. It's the most amazing experience. But I'd already been sitting for about 20 or 30 minutes because he, he knew when I was arriving, but then, of course, he thought that I'd gone or maybe that I was asleep or something. You see, creature, all creatures have attention and inattention. So listening, learn, learn to switch on, you know, you've got this wonderful apparatus, you know, listening, you know, but we're using it in such a narrow, focused way. You can enrich your life and develop your ability to be mindful 
by switching that on. So we've tried our, our vision, we've tried our hearing. What do we want to do next? Well, what about the tactile sense, that is, touch? Well, we normally think of touching with our hands. You know, we, we are these amazing creatures that walk on two feet, something we share with the ostrich, but the ostrich hasn't got any hands. But we've, because we're bipedal, we've got hands free, so we tend to think touch is only about our hands. But what about walking, walking on the grass in bare feet, or walking on the sand in bare feet, or walking on gravel, or sharp gravel? in bare feet. Have you tried that? It's pretty unpleasant. You'll find yourself walking like some awkward creature when you walk on, on gravel or on hot sand. These are, these are experiences. When, when you do that, pay attention to it. Pay attention to how that feels through your feet. Now if you're walking down this uh, leafy lane, um, you could pick up a few leaves. Feel the texture of them. When I garden, I leave a, a, a patch that's got some nettles in it, because you can do things with nettles, but I have sometimes had nettle stings. Um, I'm not sure whether I should really recommend this, but it's not the end of the world if you get a nettle sting. Especially, if, I mean, if you fall in naked into a bunch of nettles, it's going to be pretty painful. I wouldn't recommend that. But on the other hand, why not just get a little nettle sting and then just instead of rejecting it just just note it just observe it and how it develops it's not the end of the world we don't have to be rejecting how about nettles you might think nettles are nasty human beings are <laughs> much nastier <laughs> they're just protecting themselves but there are lots of leaves out there, for example, and, uh, that, that have different textures. They're all different. It's almost childlike, isn't it? It's a kind of innocence. You might think, look, I'm a grown-up. I don't do such silly things as going around feeling leaves. That's for little kids to do. Well, you have to find the child in yourself. Because there is, there is still a child in yourself. And layers of protection and pride have covered that up, which is a pity, you know. So, feel the bark on the tree. Now, as I said, some things are not so pleasant. But again, just observe your own feelings about that, your own reactions. Then what about um, smell? Now, if you were your pet dog, your world would be dominated by smell. A dog's eyesight is not that good, but its smell is phenomenal, usually, most breeds of dog. dog some, some breeds of dog can smell like a hundred times more powerfully than we can. So, their world is, is a smelly world. <laughs> it's a world made up of, of, of smells. Some interesting, some which makes them feel lustful, others which, make, which are repugnant to them. But we do have a sense of smell, but we've let it go largely. But it's there and you can develop it. Smell the leaves. Smell your food. Smell your drinks. It's closely related to taste, of course. So we, when we eat mindfully, we can smell our food, give it a sniff, and we can also taste our food mindfully. Eat more slowly, chew your food, pay attention to the chewing of the food, its texture, its tastes. You see, what is happening is that you're awakening. That's what a Buddha is, an awakened one. And the person we call the Buddha, who by the way never called himself the Buddha, was called the Buddha by others because he seemed exceptionally awake, and Buddha means awakened one. So we are embarking on a path of awakening, and this is a good way to start, with outward things. Take a full advantage of the power of your, of your senses. Initially, just to, more, to enjoy the world more, 
and enjoy being here more. If you were to go blind, then your sense of hearing would become very important to you. Then maybe things you'd never thought of would become important to you. Listening to music, listening to birdsong, because maybe those would be the things that keep you going if you were to lose your sight. Or if you were to lose your hearing, what things would become important to you then? The other senses would become more important. They're all important, and yet we neglect them. See, when we speak of gratitude, we're speaking of these things as well. Being grateful for what your senses have to offer. But of course, in the Buddha Dharma, we also teach the danger in the senses, because we are very selective with our senses, and they can lead us astray. We get attached to certain things, which we'll come to, to later. But it's certainly a good thing initially to develop what I'm calling watchfulness. I hesitate to use the word mindfulness because watchfulness is directed outwards. So try it next time you go for a walk. Nupada Way approaches meditation as a way of life, letting go of East and West, past and future, and starting afresh here and now. To find out more, visit www.newbuddhaway.org.